This video discusses the concept of reachable targets for dual mode approaches. The previous three videos then have demonstrated how you can incorporate constraints into an OMPC type algorithm and what we suggested was you used an autonomous model formulation for the predictions and expressed constraints at each sample using some inequalities. We then used an admissible set algorithm to define the constraints over an infinite horizon using a finite set of inequalities. However, what we found was the extension of this to tracking scenarios was inflexible and not really suitable for online implementation. We did propose an alternative pragmatic approach which more easily extended to tracking scenarios but potentially required excessive numbers of inequalities and did not have a formal guarantee of capturing the MCAS. So what we want to do now is maybe develop on this and say, can we do better? So we're going to look at the general implications of allowing targets and disturbances to change in conjunction with a dual mode prediction and demonstrate that this implies hard limits on the allowable values for the targets. So when we did admissible sets, we had constraints like this. We said, Assuming you had some form of transition model, xk plus 1 equals axk, then first of all, we needed that the limit, as k goes to infinity, of a to the power k was 0. We expressed constraints at each sample in this form. We said gx less than or equal to f, f strictly bigger than 0. And we said if you put all this together, you could use an admissible set algorithm to find an admissible set of the form fx less than or equal to t. Now, a critical requirement to ensure convergence of this algorithm was that the asymptotic point was strictly inside the MAS. So what we had was the limit as k goes to infinity of x of k, which I'll call here xss um, for simplicity, was such that f xss is less than, sorry, that should be a t, not an f, less than t plus epsilon, where epsilon was strictly bigger than zero. So that's one of the things that we required. How does this then apply when you have a tracking scenario? First of all, let's just rewrite the sorts of equations that we had with an SOMPC or MPC algorithm. We said you might use deviation variables, x hat to be the different distance of x from its steady state, u hat the distance of u from its steady state. We could find the steady state using the equations a bit like this. We could write our predictions now in terms of deviation variables. The key thing, however, you want to notice is these deviation variables implicitly depend on XSS, USS, which in turn depend on R minus D. And then we had a performance index, which we wrote in terms of deviation variables. Now, what do we want to change here? This is the key thing we're going to do. We want to know whether we can form a maximum admissible set while still allowing r minus d to change because obviously the variables we've used in this algorithm x hat and u hat depend on xss and uss and that changes with r minus d so we want to know how do we deal with this well this is what we're going to propose we're going to use still use deviation variables in j because that's convenient because that means i end up with a cost that looks something like j equals c transposed s c which is nice and convenient however when it comes to the constraint handling, it's actually easier to express things in terms of the original variables and integrate the term R minus D as an additional state in the autonomous prediction model. So that's the key thing you need to note here, the key change. We're going to make this term R minus D an additional state. Let's have a look at our predictions then. So there's our predictions that was covered in the previous video. If you want to uh, look and see where those equations have come from, we've got the dependence of the steady state on R minus D. That's known. So if I put those all together, then we ended up with a prediction model a bit like this. And the key thing here is we've got another variable, this R minus D. And so what I'm going to do is make this R minus D an additional state in my autonomous prediction model. So because the prediction model has got 
a state r minus d. This will appear as an estate. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make it a state in any admissible set algorithm. And therefore, and this is the crux, that state has got to have the same criteria as other states, which means things like boundedness, convergence, and so on. So we insisted on boundedness for all the states that were in our admissible set algorithm. We insisted on convergence. So therefore, we're going to need to do the same thing with this signal here if we want our admissible set algorithm to converge. If r minus d is not constrained, then because it's in this prediction model, then neither we can we constrain any of the other variables. In other words, x could go anywhere if we allow r minus d to go anywhere. So this constraint is important. So what sort of constraints might we want to apply? So first of all, we're going to define our augmented set a bit like this. You'll notice we've put this r minus d as an additional state. We've got constraints u, constraints on u, and you'll notice that we've did this in earlier algorithms. We can express the constraints on u using something like this. Now, where this is slightly different from the earlier video is because we've now put r minus d into z, this term here has now come in to the constraint equation in a different place. If we had constraints on x, then they can be expressed in a form like that, which is what we've done before. But here's the new bit. We are also going to have to put limits on r minus d to ensure that r minus d is also bounded. Now, if I combine all these constraints together, you'll notice I get something like this. I've still got a g, I've still got an f, and I've still got a z. So structurally, it looks the same as the earlier videos. The only difference is that z has got an additional state, which is this r minus d. Now, a key issue that we've got to look at is how do I define the limits on r and d? That's these two limit terms down here. We cannot just choose any target or assume any magnitude of disturbance, because that's clearly nonsense. You won't be able to do it. So the notional state and input constraints can only be satisfied if the target and the disturbance are sensible. So from, we can use some form of logic to say there must be reasonable limits on the disturbance, and there must be reasonable limits on the target. And I could use that if I wanted to define these limits here. Now, I'm not going to go into how you might do that, but just making making the point that common sense and an awareness of the scenario, you could come up with some sensible numbers. Next thing, which is more important, however, is that the steady state must lie inside the interior of the constraints for the inputs and the outputs. I might be able to come up with values here, that doesn't mean I can actually reach them. So there's some additional constraints I must satisfy. So what are these additional constraints? First of all, I know that my steady state for the input must lie between the lower limit for the input and the upper limit for the input. And you'll notice I've got an explicit term for USS in terms of R minus D. Similarly, I've got state constraints, and I know the steady state for my state must be within the constraints. So what happens if I put these constraints together? So my input constraints and my state constraints, along with my awareness of how the steady states are defined, then I can end up with constraints like this. So for the input constraints, you'll see because the input USS depends through KUR on R minus D, then I can write First of all, USS less than or equal to U over bar using this top constraint here. Or USS greater than U under bar using this constraint here. And so on. In a similar way, I can put some constraints in terms of RD upper bar and RD over bar to represent these constraints here. So these ones in pink basically tell you hard limits on the allowable values for rd under bar and rd over bar. They have to satisfy this, because otherwise I'm proposing a target and a disturbance which simply cannot be reached within my allowable values. So if I put all this together, I end up with constraints like this. And the key thing is, this tells me limits 
on what RD can be. And what I'm saying is you should check the targets you're using against these inequalities before you start, because if your R and D do not satisfy these inequalities, then they cannot be reached. That's simple common sense. There is a warning here at the bottom. These conditions are sufficient. Oh, sorry, they're necessary. Get it straight. They are necessary, but they're not sufficient. I'm not going to go into the subtleties of why they're not sufficient, because that's for a later chapter. But the key thing is they are necessary. So I'm not going to dwell on that. It's just an example that shows you can calculate these should you want to. So this video has shown that in order for a well-defined constrained problem to exist, the target must be reachable. And you can define necessary conditions for reachability. So if you assume I've got limits on R minus D, a lower limit and an upper limit, then these limits are such that when you plug them into these inequalities, these inequalities must be satisfied. And that's the key thing we've done. We've said where you've set R minus D, the corresponding steady state value for the state, steady state value for the input, must be feasible. In general, it's beyond the remit of this video. One may need tighter limits than this to ensure a target is feasible, but that comes in a later chapter. Now, here's a thing to finish on. Viewers may note that subtleties such as this particular video are usually omitted from journal papers or avoided altogether. And often journal papers use simple targets such as the origin because they really don't want to get into these issues. But it's an easy mistake to make to give a target which is just not reachable.